but with our portion of the presentation and introduction. So thanks, this meeting will be recorded. But before we get started with our fifth SFU CED public lecture, we respectfully acknowledge SFU Burnaby is located on unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I am honored to be joining from you, joining you from Invermere, BC, the shared unceded home of the Squabum, the Kiskanuk and Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley Métis. Lee and I and the entire SFU CED team are very grateful that so many CED practitioners and planners from across Canada have joined us today. And with the recent atmospheric river that has caused us all to look at our rivers, lakes, and waterways, we couldn't have planned better timing for this public lecture. The Dividends of Municipal Investments by Darren Enns. Darren Enns is the Director of Planning and Development for the Town of Banff, located within Banff National Park. The Town of Banff is a place where residents and visitors live, work, and play on the traditional territories of Black Confederacy. Stony Nakota First Nation, Tutina First Nation, Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Banff and the Bow Valley has also long been important to the Tanaha and Sequim First Nations, who traditionally occupied lands and used the watersheds along the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Darren is a professional planner, originally from the Fraser Valley of BC, with an education as a geographer and urban planner from UBC, with a stop along the way at SFU. Darren has worked in tourism land use planning most of his career, which has included stops in the consulting world of British Columbia, working for national government in the Cayman Islands, and for the last 12 years in the town of Banff. In his spare time, you can find Darren serving as municipal councillor, representing Albertans in the Kananaskis region, or trying in vain to hang on to his youth by mountain biking on a nearby tunnel or sleeping Buffalo Mountain. Personally, I can't think of a community in Canada that has become more pedestrian and cycling friendly over the last decade. From wood roofs and pedestrian bridges to intercept parking, Banff is able to provide, are able to repeatedly take the best active transportation and commerce practices from around the world and adapt them to their mountain town community as visitation increases. Today, Darren will highlight some of the case studies from the crown jewel of Canada's national park system so that you can make the most of your time vacationing in Banff this summer and the spring and fall, but also learn how municipal leadership can be guided and supported. We'll save time at the end of the presentation to hear about some of the initiatives and adaptations that you've developed for your public infrastructure, placemaking, public transport, active transportation systems. I'll be monitoring the chat and encouraging you to share your questions there, but we'll bring them forward for Darren at the end of his presentation. Or if you have a hard time to think about active transportation because you're currently under spring flood watch, how are you ensuring your community's protection today and into the future? And with the stage set, I'll turn it over to our guest, Darren Enns. Many thanks for that intro, Ryan, uh, and thank you to everyone for having me. I'm just going to take a second to get my tech sorted out here. And Ryan, how does that look? Perfect. Okay, well, fantastic. Thanks Thanks again. My name is Darren Enns, and as Ryan mentioned, I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the Town of Banff. Um, when Ryan invited me to speak today, I wasn't really sure if I was involved in the world of community economic development. Um, but the more I thought about it, and the more I thought about it in the context of CED as bringing about social, ecological, and, and economic change, I, I convinced myself that indeed I, I am a, a CED practitioner, um, but perhaps don't have the credentials. And so um, maybe Ryan will see me in his class in the near future. Um, so today, I'm, I'm looking to take you through a few case studies from Banff uh, of projects, uh, municipal projects that have paid dividends far beyond, far beyond what we initially expected. Uh, so let me just jump to the next slide here. So to give you a bit of context, we're going to walk through uh, three particular case studies that we've um, uh, completed or are in the process of completing in Banff. Um, starting with a Bear Street redevelopment project, uh, following up with our Rome Transit system, and, and then closing off with uh, the development of our pedestrian bridge network within the town. And as Ryan mentioned, uh, really looking forward to a, a question and answer and conversation after the presentation. So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to actually start with a bit of a few background slides and try to, to ground um, Banff for you, for those who haven't been in a while, but are obviously planning to come, and I'm hoping to lure you back uh, with this presentation. So Banff as a landscape uh, has been used by Indigenous people for millennia as a place for harvest, refuge, and, and trade. Um, it has always been a place that brought people together, uh, including connecting the Plains nations with those of the Salish 
Spanish-speaking people of British Columbia, as Ryan had mentioned in the introduction. Uh, and for me, in that history is a story of hospitality that I'd like to think underpins our, identi our identity today as a tourism-based community. So the evolution of tourism in Banff dates to the development of the Canadian Pacific Railroad and the so-called discovery of a local hot springs by three CPR workers as illustrated by this biblical style painting. Um, the first thing these gentlemen did after they located the springs was to build a hotel and shortly thereafter the federal government arrived and ordered them to tear it down, thus starting a 150 year debate around conservation and development in Banff, which is not wrapped up as of yet, and I don't expect it will. The town site of Banff was surveyed and laid out uh, by a gentleman named George Stewart, who went on to become our first superintendent of our national park. And he designed our community with the great photo op in mind since day one. And so here's uh, one of the earliest photos of Banff. It's a man enjoying, uh, sorry, and his cow, uh, enjoying the iconic Banff Avenue with Cascade Mountain as a background. And it's scenes like this that inspired uh, people like Cornelius Van Horn, the superintendent of the Canadian Pacific Railroad to say, well, if we can't export the scenery, we'll import the tourists. And did that through the development of a series of rail grand railway hotels, including the Banff Springs Hotel um, to serve as both stopovers for CPR guests, but tourism attractions in their own right. And that's what we've been doing ever since is importing the tourists. And you know, here are the descendants of, of that uh, man with the cow on the same Banff Avenue today, um, doing things that uh, Cornelius Van Horn would never have imagined. Um, and here's their friends about to experience the business end of an elk on uh, in front of our fire hall. And here's a few stats to help sort of set the stage or set the context for, for what happens in Banff uh, from a tourism perspective and an economic perspective. So we host the world and, and that comes with both opportunities and challenges. Our 4 million visitors demand a range of services and our role as a Nas National Park Visitor Service Center um, puts demands on residents and, and visitors or on residents specifically um, beyond what you would think in a community of 9,000 residents. So this also creates tension within our community when residents don't see benefit from the industry that sustains us. Uh, so today, what I wanted to do was to talk about three projects in Banff that have brought shared benefit to industry and residents alike, uh, and to me, define how community and economic development intertwine. Um, but before I do that, I'll maybe just run through some of the stats on the screen here. We, we do have in the town of Banff around nine thousand residents. Um, residents in Banff have to have what's called a need to reside. So this is the requirement that they are employed in the national park. So you cannot have a second home in the town of Banff, which has really helped us manage some of um, what other resort communities have been have suffered from through vacation rentals. Um, we have what's called a cap on commercial floor space. And so what that means is since 1998, the town has been allowed to grow incrementally, but uh, we have now reached what's called commercial build out. And so no more commercial floor space is allowed to be built in the town of Banff. Um, and the town's incredibly compact. It's four square kilometers. You can walk from end to end in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and so that's really created a, a great walkable uh, community and one that's minimized ecological impact on the neighboring national park. Um, so th that's a bit of a setting the stage for what, what Banff looks like. We're compact, we're busy, uh, and right now we are in the throes of a massive rebound on visitation as people remember what tourism was um, and flock to the National Park for what they've always come for, which is respite and enjoyment of natural beauty. Okay, so um, with that, I, I want to jump into our, our first case study that I wanted to look at, which is a capital project, a public infrastructure project uh, for the redevelopment of Bear Street in, in the town of Banff. To sort of set the stage of, of what the project was, it's the ten, it was a $10 million redevelopment of what we called Banff's secondary commercial street. Uh, so it's right off of our uh, main street, um, Banff Avenue. And Bear Street traditionally saw a lot less visitation than Map Avenue. Um, in fact, when we measured it, it was around a six to one ratio. So for every one person that visited Bear Street, there were six people on Map Avenue. And we were really looking to redistribute that more equitably, uh, bring more visitors to Bear Street and create more economic opportunities for business on Bear Street through that redistribution. 
so the redevelopment was driven by a lot of functional reasons as well. Uh, we inherited a 100-year-old uh, sewage and water system from Parks Canada. Thank you, federal government. Um, and that requires a lot of upkeep and redevelopment. And so we knew that we had to refurbish the pipes into the ground at some point. And when we did that, we saw a massive opportunity. Uh, and that opportunity was to create a hospitality driven streetscape, um, one that wasn't just functional in nature, but actually was infrastructure as an attraction. Um, and that was really appealing to us to be able to provide high quality public infrastructure that was in, in itself a tourism attraction. So how do we do this? Well, well, we took our time um, and it really started back uh, in the early days of Banff as a, as a municipality in the early 1990s, where we came up with a, a, concept, a conceptual plan for our downtown that saw our downtown streets become more pedestrian and cyclist friendly. We reinvigorated that plan in 2012 through a transportation master plan process. And then we started doing some trials and we trialed a number of different configurations for four years using really low impact approaches. And the point of this was to prepare residents for change and also to determine what configurations of the street work best. So it was a bit of a, um, a laboratory for us to figure out what was working and what wasn't. And that really helped inform um, how, we, how we approached a final design for the street. And here comes my first technical challenge. Let me see if I can get a video to play here as I talk over it. Oh, of course it never works when you want it to. Here we go. How's that? I'm gonna hope that's okay. So then our next step um, was to go back and to talk to the community and talk and talk and talk some more. Um, and, you know, that was uh, a really, at times challenging process, but the point was to talk about the proposed design um, in all sorts of different forms, like the one you're looking at now. Uh, we talked to the community about how it would work, about what the expected impacts were, and we listened to those concerns raised and brought them back to our council. So we used this as a, a sounding board, a place to um, voice your concerns and your opinions. Um, and you know, it, as challenging as it is for those who are, are looking to um, uh, build a project to, to keep talking and talking about it, this was actually one of the most successful parts of the project in my mind. It was a chance for us to, uh, I'm just going to try and see if I can play that again. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to turn off some volume here. Um, and one of the things I found really powerful for me was, was that we could have done a lot of this engagement digitally and online and, and talk to people via, um, you know, web surveys and, and digital models, but we actually tried hard to create a very tactile engagement experience for people. Um, we used traditional methods like poster boards. We, we bought ourselves a, a physical model um, as, of the street as opposed to a digital one. Uh, and that physical model, I, I can't tell you what a great lure that was to get people in talking. We, we set out little cars and plants and gave them to children and said, you know, think about how you'd use the street. Um, and so it seems really, I guess, old school in, in the world of public engagement. But to me, this was one of the most powerful parts of our engagement process was this tactile face-to-face -face engagement with our community. Um, so that's something that I, I took away as a really, um, really powerful um, learning from, from that process. I'm gonna try and jump aside. Right, and so as, as I mentioned, th this can seem exhausting as a practitioner and at times frustrating for those tasked with uh, actually building the project. Um, it was an amazing forum, not just for uh, government to citizen, but from citizen to citizen. And it was a great to watch these conversations occur off to the side of people with, with different views or like views and engage with one another. And I thought that was an amazing, it's, it's really nice to, to bring, that, bring that together and have a forum for those conversations to occur. Um, so the end result, of course, now I have yet another tech challenge to see if I can do this here. Uh, the end result was a street that we were incredibly proud of. And I, I'm going to use this. How's that for the sharing, Ryan? Is that great? So this is a, a CBC um, interview showing Banff Avenue here, which was closed for uh, COVID temporary closure and, and illustrates our commitment to pedestrianism. And then the end result of Bear Street, which embraces uh, a lot of innovations from a transportation and hospitality perspective. We have outdoor cafes for um, businesses to make use of a high quality infrastructure. We also have great public infrastructure like the fire pit to the left, a public seating. We really wanted to create infrastructure that you didn't have to pay to use. And, and that seems kind of strange or silly maybe, but in a national park that's very expensive, we wanted to create a high quality experience that was publicly available 
um, and part of our municipal infrastructure. And so that's really been the uptake or the response uh, from our visitors. We've seen our visitation on the street, and I'll jump to this in a second, but uh, it really spike. Um, we've seen redevelopment of businesses from, for an example, a law office converting to a brew pub um, as, as businesses that are um, able to relocate elsewhere uh, and give up valuable street front for hospitality-based businesses have moved on and others have filled their spot. And so right now, Bear Street is, is packed. It's being used as we thought it would. Um, uh, and in our minds, uh, a massive success um, just let this video roll out. And, and yeah, great to see how people have embraced the space. Uh, we're planning for a marathon to conclude here um, in a few weeks. So the actually marathon this weekend is going to wrap up on with a finish line on Bear Street. Um, and, just, whoop, and of course, I stopped sharing at the wrong time. Uh, so it's been fascinating to see. And I'm just going to jump back to screen two here. Hopefully I'm back on track. Right. So in terms of uh, Bear Street and what we learned, uh, we learned that our plan to increase visitation worked. Uh, so our pedestrian counts illustrate a doubling of pedestrian traffic on the street after year one. We're really looking to bring that up even more as we move on. Um, we're, like as, as I mentioned, we've seen reinvestment in businesses, specifically in the hospitality sector. Um, and I'm going to get to some of the downsides of that in a second. Uh, we've learned that if you create a high quality public amenities, uh, you can create more equitable opportunities for people to enjoy public space. And so we really thought hard about how to make sure the public um, could enjoy this space without paying to be at a restaurant. And we thought that that was really important that you could have a high quality experience that's not commercial in nature and that government has a role to support that. Um, and we also found that slower, and I mean slower on the streets, slower speeds, slower movement is a lot more sociable and Bear Street's become a real social hub for the community to interact, to run into each other. Um, and it's a lot easier to have that conversation on the street than it is when you're passing someone in a car. Uh, so it's a really great social space that we've created. Um, one thing that we do watch for is that with all the reinvestment in Bear Street, we're also seeing things like rising rents. Uh, so commercial landlords are able to charge more for space because it's a more valuable um, street. And that what we're worried about is that that might create signs of what we call displacement. So businesses that um, like a hardware store or an eyeglass store may get bumped out for a restaurant. And what is the impact of that to the community uh, from a social perspective is something that we're really concerned about, especially when we have finite commercial space in our community through the commercial growth cap. So Ryan, I was going to maybe save questions till the end. Uh, I've got these two more case studies, um, but that's, that's, that's Bear Street. And the second case study I wanted to jump to was uh, our Rome transit system. And so we like to think of it as the most photogenic transit system in Canada. Um, of course, that's a bit biased, but I, I pulled up one of the great photos that we take of our, our transit system here with Rundle Mountain in the background. Um, but also remember that it didn't start out that way. Uh, our starting point was a really kitschy trolley service uh, that moved people between a few, a few destinations um, and then didn't really speak to Banff as a destination in itself. Uh, but that all changed between 2008 and 2011. And that was when the town partnered with our neighboring community of Canmore, uh, Parks Canada and Improvement District Number 9, a, a rural municipality. Um, to form what's called a Regional Transit Services Commission, uh, which is in effect a shared municipal service provider uh, with partners paying to participate based on the number of service hours their community receives. And so this partnership was a critical leap forward for, uh, for our communities, for the Bow Valley and for the transit system itself. Um, and the service uh, rapidly expanded after that partnership was created. Uh, we created commuter links between Canmore and Banff, which not only helped um, with Banff's uh, ever uh, present labor challenges, we were able to draw from a broader labor pool. It also, I think, created economic opportunities for both Canmore and Banff. And, and Canmore is evolving into a full tourism based economy, I, I believe. Um, and people will start to think of our valley as a destination, not just our community. So, this is a critical link for us. Uh, it helped provide for local services within both communities. So, for example, those of us in Banff who um, can't seem to buy a pair of socks in our community because there's, there's <laughs> no local retail opportunities, they're all tourism driven, um, can now access Banff or Camor more. Uh, it's created connections to Lake Louise and other national park destinations. 
And it's also thrived from creating a number of partnerships within the community. I'm going to highlight a few of those right now. So one was a corporate partnership. So the Rome Transit System said, you know, all these hotels in Banff, rather than buying your own shuttle buses to move people around, why don't we let you buy into our transit system in bulk? And so basically the hotel partnerships allow for a hotel to create a one-time contribution per year. Um, you take your room key, you get on the bus, and all of a sudden, instead of a bunch of private underfunded um, shuttle buses moving around our destination, we have a single cohesive transit system to, to rely on. So it's great as a visitor, uh, you just take your room key out, go, jump on the bus, and it's a very seamless experience. Um, a second example is a school partnership. So working with local schools to uh, allow for uh, students to move between both the camera and the BAMP school system so that children in our communities can benefit from, from both, um, both communities' uh, education offerings. And both Banff and Canmore, and I have to applaud Canmore because they took the lead on this. Um, they've also managed to offer fair, free transit for residents. So Canmore did this right off the bat. Um, BAP took their time. We actually implemented a pay parking system to fund this last year. And so our council said, we want visitors to pay for parking, but we want that money to go back into sustainable transportation. One of the um, elements they supported was uh, a, a fair free transit system for residents so that we can jump on the bus as residents and enjoy the fruits of our investment in the tourism based economy and feel like we're benefiting from that. Some other things that we've trialed is regional or retrialing our regional transit to Calgary. Um, and I noticed, or I, I highlighted it at the photo of the bus from the first screen, we embrace local photographers to brand our buses. And so all our buses have a specific animal associated with it. So you can say, I got on the Fox bus or the trout bus. I, I don't know how the trout got on there, but it's not the most um, um, sought after bus. But anyways, uh, using local animals, local photography to celebrate that which is our, our local sense of identity here in the Bow Valley. So ridership as a result of all these investments took off, uh, growing at a fairly exponential rate until of course a global pandemic hits you. Um, and so this graph is pretty illustrative of what happened in Banff in the last two years. Um, transits really suffered and that's been compounded by um, COVID and, and obviously um, restrictions on, on use of public transit. So. What we've learned from investing in public transit and the Rome transit system is, well, first of all, that we're stronger together. Um, we, our communities could all have had their own independent transit systems and done our own thing, but uh, working with partners was exponentially beneficial. And it's also helped to secure uh, more grant funding from provincial partners. When, when provincial and federal partners see communities working together, they see efficiencies. And that, that's really what's been pushed in Alberta is regional services as opposed to municipal ones. And so we've really benefited from a lot more funding by working together with, with our partners. Um, we've also found that being a case study for innovation helps. So you'll, you might've noticed in some of those images, our bus, will start, our bus system started out using diesel electric hybrids, and now we're moving towards a full electric fleet. And what that introduces is opportunities for a lot of funding the, from higher levels of, levels of government that wanna support that transition. Um, and so we've managed to secure a lot of grant funding to make that uh, transition come true. And the third lesson is that when we can provide community connections, free transit for residents, benefits for school children, um, that causes residents to see the value of what might otherwise have been seen as solely a tourism-based investment and helps break down those barriers between the us and them of, of business and, and community. And so those have been, I think, huge wins to, to, to gain support for public transit um, in Banff and for making investments that have dividends beyond just the business community. All right, so uh, my third case today, I'm sorry, I know I'm moving pretty quick here, but I'm conscious of time and, and really wanna have um, some conversation with, with the group. Uh, the third case study is, is another example of investment in infrastructure and what I call infrastructure as an attraction. Um, don't worry, the gentleman on the bottom left is just having fun with the photo op. He's not um, imbibing in the nightlife of Banff. Um, but these are a case study of our pedestrian bridge network that we've, um, we've invested in over the last decade in Banff. Um, and this isn't a new initiative in Banff. It actually dates back um, to the 19, 1900s, 1914. Um, Banff was always designed as a tourism-based community, as I mentioned, and a bit of history. In, in 1914, uh, Banff uh, and Western Canada brought over a British town planner by the name of Thomas Mawson. And Thomas Mawson did plans for, um, for Calgary, which he called Vienna on the Bow. And they laughed him out of Calgary and they said, we'll never be a beautiful city. 
in the right. Um, he then came to Banff and did a plan for, uh, for Banff, um, focusing on creating a lot more pedestrian amenities and the central Banff Avenue, uh, but also a series of pedestrian bridges. Uh, and then he moved on to Vancouver, which he called Paris on the Pacific, um, and did a plan for Vancouver. For those of you who know Vancouver, you'll see remnants of his plan around um, uh, City Hall, uh, 12th and Canby. Um, so the Mawson plan always suggested that we were going to have a series of pedestrian bridges. Uh, it only took 97 years for us to actually make it happen. Um, but we're really kind of realizing this vision uh, that was granted to us or gifted to us uh, 97 years ago. And so the first opportunity was back in 2011. We had a failing underwater sewage pipe, which went underneath the river, um, which provided us with an opportunity to reimagine what was supposed to be a utility crossing as something much more. And that let us, uh, gave us the opportunity to build our first pedestrian bridge, which was called the Muskrat Street Pedestrian Bridge. Again, aligned north-south to take advantage of Cascade Mountain in the background and this great backdrop and, and photo opportunity. Um, it also serves, uh, serves a multitude of purposes for our community, including a visitor and uh, re resident pedestrian amenity. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, a utility conduit for sewage to go across the river. Not a very sexy topic, but I have to talk about it. Um, it's uh, a photo op and, and wedding venue, which is something we never really imagined. Um, and a special event venue. Here's that same Banff Marathon making use of the pedestrian bridge. Uh, as a venue and, and a great photo opportunity for, for these runners and others to just take a second and say, wow, what a, what a great place and what a place to enjoy. Um, and so our learnings from our pedestrian bridge and uh, our, our first pedestrian bridge project was that it was an instant success. Um, we went from hundreds to thousands to almost 10,000 crossings a day. Uh, July 1st was our peak day at 7,500 people across that bridge. It's also become an essential link for residents. And this is, again, I talk about Bear Street and these other examples um, of community benefit. Uh, this is the place where you're gonna find school children commuting to school in the morning. They don't have to worry about battling out with cars on a busy street. Uh, you see residents stopping and um, talking to each other, complaining about the town planning department, um, whatever people do in Banff when they, when they see each other. Uh, and that success has actually spurred on an additional investment in a second bridge. And so um, just this year, we managed to uh, start construction on the Nazi Paw Bridge, sponsored by a local um, philanthropic organization, the Women Nazi Paw Foundation, uh, as well as uh, municipal funding and, and grant funding. Um, and this new crossing will connect Banff Central Park with our recreation grounds and will replace thousands of winter crossings over frozen river ice right now. And so this starts to create a bit of a network or add to our network of pedestrian amenities from Bear Street to Muskrat Street Bridge to this bridge. Um, and when it looks like when it's finished, which will be, in a, uh, well, looking out my window, uh, I'm hoping in a couple of weeks, uh, we just actually uh, went through a flood watch here in Bapsville. Um, I'll tell you a bit about that. But what, this is what it'll look like when it's finished. Um, and what our learnings were from our pedestrian bridge projects were that when we think outside the box, our sewage pipe, if you will, um, it allows us to seize more opportunities than, than we would have seen before. Um, we also learned that high quality public infrastructure can be reimagined by the community in ways you never thought. So when we built our pedestrian bridge, we, we never thought in a million years that we'd come across a wedding there or a marathon or, or what have you. Um, but the way that the public reimagines high quality public spaces is inspiring. And, and you know, I, I encourage you to think about it with your own communities about um, what does more look like. And finally, you know, extending benefits um, beyond just the to, to residents can really help them understand the benefits of serving tourists uh, or serving your business community, in, in our case, tourism. Um, and so Ryan, I was going to say, yeah, the la our first pedestrian bridge was built in 2013. Uh, roughly a week after it was built, we experienced the highest waters uh, in Alberta's history and almost, uh, you know, we're worried that our bridge was going to flood away. And then now we're building our second bridge. And sure enough, uh, we went on flood watch uh, a few days ago. Um, so our pedestrian bridges are well tested. So maybe that's my plug for the infrastructure fans out there. Um, nothing to worry about when you cross those bridges in Banff. So uh, I'm hoping that was a, a helpful um, tour through three specific projects in Banff, uh, Bear Street, the Rome Transit System, and our pedestrian bridge network. Uh, we're working hard to create high quality infrastructure for our visitors and to convey the benefits of that to our residents. And in doing so, 
um, see the benefits of living in a tourism-based community and, and lessen the burden of living where the world visits. Uh, so that's my uh, whirlwind tour through the town of Banff, but you're all gonna come visit and I can tell you this in person next time I see you.